It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to this uh, spring 2018 symposium, African Studies Symposium on Honoring Ancestors in Africa and Beyond Arts and Actions. Before I pour something for our ancestors, I want to start by acknowledging the land on which we stand. Because in the Yoruba tradition, you always recognize those who first step their foot on the land on which we stand. And it's the beginning of that idea of the fact that we all are standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. So we recognize this land, the land of the Ho-Chunk, mm -hmm. and the four sacred lakes that surround us. And we recognize that we are here only with their earlier presence on this space. And we start with that acknowledgement. And to their ancestors, and I hope they don't mind dry gin. Uh, I, know, I know Yoruba ancestors don't. <laughs> and so I pour some of those first drops to have them drink with us and share with us today. Ashe. 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 You know, the Google tradition of honoring the spirit of ancestors is a family matter. It's a gathering of family, a collaborative effort to honor those who have departed. I'm reminded that on Wednesday, April 4th, we celebrated another passing, a passing that hurt us very deeply, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. His life and his principles and his ideals were things that guided us during his lifetime. But all of those ideas and principles continue to guide us as we find our way. That's one of the things that I felt so deeply as I learned about the Egongo tradition. Ancestors are not dead. They are departed. They exist in a different realm. But we communicate with them, and they communicate with us. Every time we remember our loved ones who have passed on, and we remember the things that they taught us during their lifetimes, we are honoring them. We're celebrating them. They continue to guide us and show us the path. And so that's one of the key themes and ideas of this conference. And it's one of the central ideas of the exhibition that I hope you have all seen or will see um, tomorrow in the second day of the symposium, Whirling Return of the Ancestors, uh, Egungo Parts of Europe in Africa and beyond. We are here to uh, invite the ancestors. We are here to invoke their names. We are here to make them come down and um, stay with us throughout this symposium. So, Iba to the ancestors. Iba. 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 Iba lowa lage mo tere la o ti arun mo ma ku wa ju ba to pa ju ni lo ti won ti lo iba la ta te lo ti mo gara ile ha po po ye ni a la po ka o ga ni ni mama ti ide wa mi ho ju awa o ti e o iba gbogbo awon ti won ti ku ti won ti saju wa lo Iba won to tele aye ido iba gbogbo awa ti won wa ka wa o to se Iba lori gun mere ni gbogbo agbalaye Iba gbogbo awon ya mi abeni aroba so ti o ni kole Iba o ko to ri koro ti o ro mi iba o to to ri koro ti o seje 
We are entering the land of call and response. So, um, you have responded to my greetings and also to the Ijuba that uh, Ushe Gung has just given us. Um, keep that in mind as we listen to the talks because this is a start of a conversation. It is what I regard as a kind of meta modern Igungung installation. It's a little different from the way in which several fabrics are combined and sewn and stitched together to create, you know, uh, this beauty, for instance. But OKBG's okay, Egungun is a little different. There are panels there. Unlike being stitched with several layers of cloth, we are pigments. But I was particularly intrigued by the integration of text. And I looked carefully. Virtually all the texts speak about the market. Here, for instance, that is the kind of greeting uh, that you say in honor and in salute you know, of the women who are within the market space. You recognize them. You acknowledge them, and then they respond. Ajay Awoba, Ajay is the Yoruba goddess of money, of commerce. And when Ajay enters into the ways, you are likely to go home smiling. You are likely to make a lot of money. I looked very carefully. There were several references to the market. And this instantly evoked and triggered for me the very beginning of Igungun tradition in Ojaife. When Amayugun decided to stop the incessant rape and terror that death constituted to the people of Ife. Death will come with his acolytes and bring clubs and uh, beat people and take some into slavery or perhaps sell them. Until Amayegun decided that he was going to put a stop to that and he approached Ubishanla as well as the Oni, the ruler artifact if it could be allowed to ward up this evil from the society. And what did Amayegun do? He got different fabrics, combined the fabrics to create a wonderful costume, a colorful costume. The colors are not of this world. Name all the colors of the rainbow, they are there. But how could just an individual use different colors to scare death away? <clears throat> but as soon as Amayegun donned the costume, death and his acolyte, who came back, took fright at this strange character. And Amayegun was able to chase death away, kill some of his acolytes, and that, according to Yoruba or our tradition, was the beginning of masking tradition. But where this event took place was at Ojaife. Because it is at the markets that you have a, a huge convergence of people who are interacting. But then the market itself is like a microcosm of Yoruba society. Everyone participates in the market. Looking at this object, it triggered that memory of the significance of market in the establishment of this cultural tradition itself. And so on 
three levels, these you know, different installations have very profound special meanings for me. So there are these symbols, most of what he, he creates are, are symbols and they're, they're called okadi, um, these motifs, and they have meanings um, behind them. So this one uh, represents uh, power and uh, strength, the eagle, and it's mostly for chiefs or people in power. The snail and um, the turtle or the tortoise, um, so this is also a symbol of power, but it is symbol of patience and um, uh, what happens is most of the time when there is a conflict um, in a family or in a clan, um, it ultimately they'll try, parents will try, the clan head will try to resolve it, but then it finally works its way to the chief. Um, and what happens is it takes a while, you will not get the verdict right there. It takes time, they do the investigations, they call you in a number of times, and so, uh, and so uh, the same thing is with lawyers, you know, what the lawyers do if you've ever had a case, it never, it never, and in Ghana especially, it goes on forever. <laughs> so, uh, but, but it is a status of, uh, symbol of um, patience, you have to be patient. Now the point is, with the turtle, they will finally get to their destination, it's not going to be just like that, but they will get there. Uh, whether they get there in one piece or not, they still will get there. So this is interesting because, yeah. Um, so, so I said, what has religion got to do with soccer ball? <laughs> but uh, the interesting thing was that, um, so what happened? I was telling you about Kanikwe's uh, uh, grandfather, who was um, the traditionalist and had not been converted to Christianity. Um, um, when he was doing all these things, but when by the time he he died, he had converted, <clears throat> and so what? Apparently, uh, for you to be taken to the church and prayed on, you know, for all the funeral stuff to be done in church, um, you have to be in the conventional coffin, you know, like you see. Um, so if they do the turtle or the pepper and all those things, the pastors would not allow the coffin to be brought into church. So I said, I don't understand. And um, he said, well, those things were seen as quote unquote paganistic. Anything tradition, traditional is pagan, you know. And with religion, and if you've been to Ghana, you would see the role that religion is playing. It's wonderful, just incredible. And so, he, um, um, so the grandpa could not be uh, buried in you know, any of the designer coffins. It had to be the, this type. So the same thing, because this person was a soccer player, but a Christian, they could not do the coffin in the shape of a soccer ball. So these are mostly fishermen. Um, you know, if you're, if you're uh, a fisherman, you get to have those lovely uh, coffins. And this is for a teacher. <laughs> well, <laughs> so very, I mean, the laptop, they should start looking for, you know, stuff like that, because I don't know how many people write, use that. And especially big, you know, big. <laughs> so it could be a, a notebook or a pen, and this for the, uh, for the nurses. It could also be a stethoscope. But you know, this is really uh, imaginative, and, and people are very proud. <laughs> Very proud to be really creative, really creative. And I would love, if we had time, I would love to go around and ask every person what they would love to. I mean, don't shy away from his coming. So in 1976, as a political prisoner in Johannesburg's notorious women's jail, sociologist and anti-apartheid activist Fatima Mir secretly produced a series of paintings depicting the experience of prison life for women. Similarly, similarly to Nelson Mandela's autobiography, Mir's paintings were smuggled out of the jail and kept at a secret location until after South Africa's formal transition to democracy in 1994. Like Mandela's words, Mir's images provide a valuable record of incarcerated life for political activists in apartheid South Africa, although they are distinctly different given their singular focus on women. They depict and now they memorialize the suffering and the daily humiliations that women endured 
as well as moments of female companionship, friendship, political organizing, and resistance. Mir has since written that during her incarceration, the act of painting was a survival strategy for, quote, keeping the pain at bay. Formerly an apartheid era prison, the Johannesburg Women's Jail has since been remade into a museum and an activist space. Fatima Mir's paintings have been returned to the jail, the space of her imprisonment, and now end their creation, and they can be viewed there on site. Visitors to the jail now encounter enlarged reproductions of Mir's paintings while they tour the prison's exterior grounds and interior spaces. Paired with text panels, including explanatory text about women's political activism and testimony from former prisoners, the paintings help guide visitors through the space of the jail, and they assist in teaching about women's experiences. Mir's paintings and the women's jail itself play an important role in reshaping our understanding of how trauma, suffering, and incarceration are profoundly gendered experiences. The reconstructed jail provides an important counterpoint to the post-apartheid prison narrative that has been established predominantly by and about men. It establishes a women's penitentiary narrative. This is accomplished primarily through centering women's voices in exhibition spaces throughout the museum. The overall curatorial strategy is to foreground women's narrative accounts of their own prison experiences with emphasis on their acts of resistance against apartheid. The success of the jail is that it shows women's experiences as central to the experience of nationhood and it grants them authority. So each cell was once occupied by a single woman. Today, each of the cells contains an installation using a variety of media that tells the story of one single former prisoner's life. When a visitor first enters the cell, you experience the sort of excruciatingly confined space. You watch and hear a former prisoner tell part of her story of suffering and survival. The former prisoner and her voice are physically present on the video screen, positioned at eye level as if you were looking at her straight on. Each cell also includes a single object. The women featured in the isolation cells were asked to select one meaningful object that connected to their prison experience, something that was unavailable or inaccessible to them during the time of their detention. This cell tells the story of Deborah or Debs Machoba. Debs was active in the black consciousness movement in the rural areas, and then she participated in the 1976 student uprising in Soweto. The cell tells the political story of her activism and the personal story of her wedding, which you see here is her wedding dress, which she was not able to wear because her arrest prevented her from attending her own wedding. <clears throat> the women's monologues tend not to offer explicit details about pain and suffering. There's little talk of physical torture, although that happened but rather they focus on the time that they lost in their lives, significant events or opportunities that they missed, and the devastating personal sacrifices they made for the new nation. The result is a conceptually sophisticated and nuanced representation of a past that tells a political story, a story that deepens our understanding of women's role in this struggle. Divination is fundamentally a communicative process between the forces of the universe, primarily the Orishas and Egungu, and human beings. There are various forms of divination. I'm sure that today we're going to hear about Ifa divination, but I'm going to speak to you specifically about Merindilogun divination, or what we know and what we call Dilogun, which literally means 16 calorie divination. And it's the most widespread form of divination for Lukumi practitioners. The messages contained within this divination literature are also presented by poems, but based on the restrictive circumstances of enslavement, it was no longer possible for Lukumi priests and elders to learn these long epic poems. So they translated the content of those poems into stories that we call apataki, being a combination of the two terms, itan for story, pataki for significance, a pataki. So that is what we know. This is the content of the Odu. 
that we refer to as stories of significance. The first hepatiki you heard uh, briefly from my brother Bolaje this morning, and but I'm going to recite the hepatiki as if I were reading someone. A long time ago on earth, particularly the birthplace of the Yoruba, Ife, was regularly invaded by Iku, who is death, and her followers. After time, most of the people of Ife were destroyed, and those that were left lamented bitterly and were particularly afraid to go to the marketplace, because that is where Iku and her followers would come. The king of Ife, the Oni, also lamented the loss of so many of his people, and they prayed and supplicated to the Orishas, but the Orishas themselves could not do anything to stop this rampant abuse from Iku. So finally, a minor Orisha, Amayegun, decided that he would save the people of Ife. Ife. He went to Orishanla, also known as Obatala, and he went to the Oni and he said, I have the solution to this problem. And he performed sacrifice. He consecrated his materials. And he made a costume of colored cloths, bells, which completely covered his whole body. He called his followers and told them of his plan. The next morning, they went and hid in the marketplace. And when Iku came to the marketplace, they came out of hiding. They frightened Iku. They frightened death and death's followers and stole the sticks that they were using to hit the people of Ife over the head, to kidnap and murder them. And they chased away death. And every year, in commemoration of Amayegun and his followers, this ritual, this Egungu masquerade, is performed. This is particularly significant in the Lukumi context because even death has rules. You can't just rampantly go and take people to the other side. <laughs> it has to be their time. It has to be sanctioned. So it's very important that equals running amok wasn't sanctioned by Orisha wasn't sanctioned. So even death could be defeated. The reverence of Egungu is an integral part of our system. And divination is also an integral part of our system. So it's only logical that the Apataki would tell us how we are supposed to revere our Egung. Because as we say, it begins and ends with Egung. One of the things that uh we do in Yoruba land when um, we have uh, problems is we go to the Ifa diviner or the Eridilogun person as you just presented and we ask questions. In this instance, I felt that why can't we address art historical problems to the diviner, to the Eridilogun person? and ask specific questions and see what they would say. And that is exactly what I did. I um, went to a Babalao who I had been discussing with for a couple of years, and I asked this question. And uh, it was a very fascinating uh, experience. And I will share some of this with you. This work uh, is a shukon with Odufa signature. It's at the Odudua Shrine in Leife, and it's made by uh, a former student of mine, Dotun Popola. And uh, we see here this cone that uh, uh, has the Odufa inscribed on it. And um, I continue, because if the issue is so important to matters of interpretation uh, in Ifa and Yoruba ways of thinking, when you go to a Babalawa with that kind of question, uh, he asks you, who is Kant? He doesn't know Kant. So you, um, you, you, you have to describe Kant to this Babalawa, 
and um, uh, he would even, if possible, to know who was his father and his mother, <laughs> where they were born. Those are, those are things that are very important um, so that the divination can go properly. I then had to give some kind of background. Um, so the question of Kent, as presented before Rumila here, is not intellectually linear. There is no linear, that is exclusively cerebral and objective conditions bereft of spherical dimensions in Ifa traditions. Descartes and mathematical applications of linear reason only, therefore, fail to count in Ifa traditions. Ifa rotundity predominates. This corner qualification of Ifa, simultane Ifa simultaneity applies to African art as a symmetrical union of intellectual and emotional matters derives from issue, the divinity of simultaneous gates and gazes. Since the Kantian process proposes a purely linear intellectual inquiry into aesthetics, what does Ifa have to say about Kant? This is the question I presented to the Babalao. The question for Yoruba language and image, does this Kantian semiotic work in Yoruba art. The spherical Yoruba culture, and uh, Professor Drua has described it as uh, um, a god, a calabash, that uh, is round. The spherical Yoruba culture does not pre prescribe the superiority of language over image. People actually say, Ujularowa. Metaphors reside in the eyes. Words exist optically. Words are in the eyes. Words are visual. This simultaneous dislocation of anatomy is not linear, but rotund. Yoruba culture does not have a Kantian, a priori image before language, or the linear location of language before images. Images turn to words and vice versa in a fluid flow that is not hierarchic. And that's just this presentation demonstrates. It's all visual, isn't it? And we're reading it, and it's words. Imagine that you are in a crowded room, a crush of bodies pressing you as you crouch with your back to the wall. It is nighttime, perhaps midnight. Maybe you have one or two small children on your lap. It's hot, you are sweating. The room is very dark lit only by the occasional pale flicker of a cell phone and by a few small oil lamps hung high on the walls. The space is filled with smoke and incense that make your eyes burn. And your ears are filled with the call and response of singing voices, the hiss of metal rattles, and persistent drumming. <laughs> You can't see much, only the dim outline of dancing bodies moving slowly in a circle, clockwise, around a cluster of objects in the center of the room. Someone presses a bit of dry powder into one of your palms and you lick it. It's sweet and spicy. They pull you up and you join the circle of dancers, taking small steps, your hips and buttocks, back and forth, swaying up and down with each step. I took you to that dark, hot, music-filled room to set a multi-sensorial stage for my exploration of the bodily dimensions of an art object category called Encoba. Encoba are anthropomorphized medicine containers used in Shamba healing contexts, such as the medicine dance you just journeyed to. They are key sites of human ancestor relations. They are facilitators of health. Many Shamba people continue to advance an ancient Bantu worldview 
whereby wellness depends on sustained reciprocities between the human realm and an ephemeral one teeming with unseen forces such as nature spirits and ancestors. Ancestors require that people follow a set of socio-cultural laws called mila. When people neglect to do so, their ancestors send illnesses to people, communities, and to landscapes as reminders. Healers then enlist in koba and other art forms such as music, dance, and sacred speech to discern diagnoses and to restore health. A dance of sort also takes place through dressed in koba. The bodies of Nkoba, like those of human, are in perpetual, subtle flux. Tutelary spirits continually prompt healers to interact with adornments that Nkoba wear, to shift the cloths in which they are draped, to add a string of beads or a bindu around the waist of the Nkoba, to adjust or add an earring. They perform such actions in perpetuity. Through such interactions, and through their ostent ostentatious display of items so deeply associated with dance, health, and the ways of the ancestors, Nkoba also partake in a dance, this time of a much subtler rhythm and pace. They too are portraits of healthy dancing bodies. Given this, I suggest that the Shamba sensorium, unlike that of Euro Americas, is not dominated by sight. I propose that Nkoba are, in fact, figurative, and that in Shamba ancestral arts, figur figurative imagery privileges movement over mimesis, embodying a local, deep seated belief that to be human and to be healthy is to dance. Now my interest here brings together the issues of remembering the past and memorializing the past in the creation of monuments that engage and reify history. Memorials and monuments are designed to create what's considered a highly charged space of collective introspection, political strife, and yearning for change. And just as the appearance and performance of an Igungan may be a source of pride for a lineage in a community, as their story and the creation of the community is recognized and acknowledged, so are these monuments in the consecration of the nation and the national ideal. And when specifically dealing with black subjectivity and the sphere of representation, memory and memorializing and the capacity for self-representation have been at the heart of racial politics. And no, and no era has been more contentious than the slave era. But we could now argue maybe this era is more contentious. In generating questions about representing the arc from immured misery and trauma to freedom. And when looking at the visual corpus in black subjectivity, the consciousness of black people collectively form an emotional epistemology in which public feelings have shaped historical monuments ideals of citizenship, and understandings of self and national identity. And the concepts of the functional power of the ancestors and their influence on the living often meet through these ideals. Robert E. Lee stands in the psyche and the memory of white Virginians and white Southerners similarly as a hallowed ancestor and a symbol of nation building. That he was the general of the losing side during the American Civil War adds to the pathos surrounding his imagery and the longing on the part of the living for a past that has passed. Lee's canonization found official expression on May 7, 1890, when a thousand people roped and hauled his statue to what was then co what's called now Monument Avenue. Purportedly, many of these devotees took pieces of the rope to commemorate this deification and center him as one of the founders of the nation. This heroic depiction of Lee projects an idealized conceptualization of strength and dominance as he holds in check a powerful animal that obeys his commands and will. And of course, the sheer size of these kinds of monuments conveys the importance accorded to him personally and as a symbol of nationhood. 
Advocates for the removal of the statues in an ensuing lawsuit pointed out that these monuments were not in fact created to remember history or the Civil War, but rather they were placed around the South 30 years or more after the Civil War as symbols of intimidation to uphold Jim Crow segregation. But significantly, the lawyer who advocated for the monument stated, this is, and I'm quoting, this is about punishing us for our, our ancestors. So what does this mean for the concept of ancestry when such controversy is generated due to conflicting narratives? What does it signify for individual and collective belonging to the nation? Can Lee be both a deified ancestor and a symbol for racist ideo ideologues? And how do we reconcile these competing and clashing narratives because they extend beyond issues of these actual monuments as they make central the issues of space, of place, and positionality, the questions of the relationships between memory, history, self-determination, nationhood, and national belonging. I cannot answer these questions. <laughs> Fallism describes a series of campaigns that aim to uproot colonial legacies, and black consciousness motivates a sizable part of them. This paper honors Steve Biko, who's commonly considered the father of black consciousness, who was murdered in police custody in September of 1977. Fallism was generated by people who had lost patience with tempered conversations that put true transformation just out of reach, always on the horizon. They're wary of race uh, b awareness building workshops and things like these, these tired discussions that are essentially racial gesture politics. That is, as Nicola Rolak of Witts University said, they appear to offer serious engagement with the issue of race inequality, but in reality, they do very little to actually end it. Like grassroots campaigns everywhere today, fallism varies depending on local context. But since these are rapidly shared through social media, local communities, their interests, they broaden, they merge with others, and thus they build distinct bridges and commonality across time and space. I want to make clear, though, that in both cases, in the 1970s and uh, uh, in our time as well, these people are engaged with decolonizing space. And by that, I mean both the places that we occupy and the bodies that we uh, possess. And that economic justice is important <coughs> to all of them. Critiquing capitalism has always been a BC objective. Um, a little bit more than a month before Biko died, he was interviewed by a journalist with the International Aid and Defense Fund who asked him, when you speak of an egalitarian society, you mean a socialist one? And he said, yes, I think there's no way running away from the fact that in South Africa there is such an ill distribution of wealth that any form of political freedom which does not touch on the proper distribution of wealth will be meaningless. If we have a mere change of faith, face of those in governing positions, what is likely to happen is that black people will continue to be poor and you will get f few blacks filtering through into the so-called bourgeoisie and our society will be run almost as if of yesterday. So therefore, for meaningful change to occur, occur, there needs to be an attempt at reorganizing the whole economic pattern and economic policies within this particular country. This particular movement notably relies on black consciousness to critique capitalism's damaging core. It was launched, as you can see here at Witts in Johannesburg on October 14th, 2015, and it reverberated across numerous university campuses nationwide. Now, although resistance to rising tuition costs, as much as 10.5% that year, um, uh, names the activists hashtag, their demands coalesced with workers' rights on campus, um, and campuses are seen as uh, extensions of the state by and large. So they wanted to end the outsourcing of labor. And Witts, at Witts University, workers had already established 15 years of um, working toward uh, ending the abusive labor practices of that university. And then decolonize, decolonizing the curriculum was also part of this Fees Must Fall campaign. As Noor uh, Niftagotin said, students need to recognize themselves in these programs. And I'll say too that uh, faculty also, workers, faculty, and students all came together in Fees Must Fall. I teach a course at Oberlin called Slavery and the Problem of the Visual. It's an advanced undergraduate seminar. Um, I've taught it twice now. And the course asks, what aesthetic strategies can we or should we use to respond to the history and memory of transatlantic slavery? 
Or is the development of visual culture so intimately related to the emergence of the transatlantic slave trade that that task is impossible? And if it is impossible, is it still important to try? The case study then um, is Cape Coast Castle. Just to give a little bit of context on the building, Cape Coast Castle on the southern coast of Ghana is one of about 40 or so forts still in the country today. Uh, it was founded in the 1650s as a trading outpost by the Swedish Africa Company on permission of the King of Fetu. In 1664, it was taken over by the British, converted primarily to a slave fort as the final holding station for Africans captives from the interior, primarily enslaved by the Ashanti of the Fonte. In 1665, the stone building was constructed. That was its central function as a slave fort up until 1807, the abolition of the slave trade. After that point, it was um, a merchant area, briefly the capital administrative center of the colony. It was later a school, and now it is a museum. I preface all of those other uses of the building and all of those other histories of the building because it is decidedly its history of involvement in the slave trade that is the almost singular way in which it is processed today, especially um, for travelers to Ghana and particularly for Americans and African Americans. For our tour, the tour guide left off the light on our descent. And what hit me quickly was not just the darkness, but the slipperiness. The inability to keep my footing, the inability to see where I was going, the sensorial deprivation that was necessary, not only in terms of time, um, not only in terms of light, but also in terms of space, and that I was unable to sort of situate or settle my own kind of spatial relationship here. That entrance into the dungeon is one of the key moments in Hartman's text. I trudged from one side of the dungeon to the other. Each step I took tottering and indecisive. I moved back and forth with the slump shoulders of defeat. I traced the perimeter of the cell disappointed. I stepped over the gutters traversing the floor. My hands glided over the walls as though the rough surfaces were a script that I could read through my dull fingers. But the brush of my hand against stone offered no hint nor clue. What I wanted was to feel something other than the bricks and lime. What I wanted was to reach through time and touch the prisoners. It's a heartbreaking point in the book because she has traveled this way to forge some kind of connection that she imagined would be there and that ultimately the space is not giving her what she wanted. And that then reflects back on her when she asks, well, why did I want that? Um, why was it that I wanted to make these lives in the past useful for me, to have them perform for me in some way? And so I was thinking about this point as I was looking back through my photos that I took at Cape Coast and noticed that one of the conditions of visibility of this installation for me, because there is a single light in that space, a light which we asked to be turned on, it reflected my shadow over the entire installation. Right? Um, <clears throat> that I was unable to see those heads through this kind of way that my silhouette had taken over the space, a silhouette that may do, be doing exactly the opposite kind of work from what Flora's silhouette was doing in 1796, right? Um, and I thought about my desire to light a room, uh, a desire to see, because I took this photo on August 13th, 2017, and I had been on kind of a Facebook break at that point while I was in Ghana, but this photo was two days before. Um, other people, many of whom look like me, in the space of a university, lighting up statues, lighting up histories in order to highlight what they desired to see in a racist past that they wanted to see illuminated. That event was both before and after I went into Cape Coast because I sort of heard about it on August 11th and I was there on August 15th or on August 13th and then I went home and I just wrote a note to myself. Two days ago I spent somewhere between five minutes and an eternity in the dungeon at Cape Coast Castle a surgically efficient slave fort built by the British. It is the darkest place I've ever been. What does it mean that as I stood there, Charlottesville was set ablaze by the torches of racists? What does it mean that as I return home tomorrow to a nation on fire, but still it seems no less dark than that dungeon? Hey, Cabo! Oh. This community has become friends to us. And so when I said, uh, how would you like to come up to springtime in Wisconsin? <laughs> uh, they said, well, okay. You are the children of Oyotunji. Here in uh, South Carolina, Sheldon, South Carolina, that was started in approximately 1970 to start a traditional Yoruba village based on the customs and traditions of our ancestors from Yoruba land, right here in America for 
African Americans to be able to reconnect with our past post slavery in the Middle Passage. We are the second and third gen and fourth generations that came from these people. And as you can see, we continue our culture. We continue to live it every day. We wear it, we eat it, we eat it, we sleep it, we marry it. A red is a masquerade mainly for the entertainment of the children, of the people, to bring joy, to bring happiness. And a lot of times an ere will precede an actual egungu masquerade to get the people riled up and get the people ready for egungu to come. This is Jakuta. Jakuta is also an ere. An ere that represents the energy of Sango Jakuta. Sango, who is the KBAC, the king of kings of electricity, of royalty, of fire, thunder, lightning, pump, pageantry, being beautiful, being elegant, you know, being pompous, being even arrogant. <laughs> this area represents the energy of Shango because we know, especially in this diaspora, Shango is very, a very, very important deity to us. Some people will even refer to the tradition as the Shango religion. Because Shango was a very predominant deity in bringing us through slavery and those things that we had to go through to get back here where we are today. Oyotunji would be called Egunla. Egunla is the honored elders of the Egungu. The Egungu, the, the patron, the, the, the head, the top of the echelon, and the Egungu. And, and today, the Egunla you will see is Onida. Onida, because he is the magician. Onida is the trickster. Onida is the one that brings the magic to our society, that makes it incredible, that makes it dynamic. All of those good things that happened to you and you don't know where they came from. And you just give thanks to the Onida. So you will also see Baba Leko. Baba Ileko. Baba Uluko. However you, wherever you come from, donation may be different. But that is basically the teacher. Baba Leko is the one who teaches us. The one who makes sure we follow the rules and live our lives with good character according to the customs of our ancestors. Baba Ileko is always seen with a Latori or what we call, might sometimes, a disciplinary switch. When you are giving information, when you are receiving information, there must be discipline in that transformation of the information. So whether you're receiving it or not, you might get an app, you might get detention, or you might get the switch. Then at the end, we have our, one of our ancestors that actually helped to start Oyotuji. He was the right hand to Oba Sejime, Chief Elamosha Awolowo. Shesha Awolowo! Shesha Awolowo! Shesha Awolowo! not leave here saying that, oh, my children is good. I don't want them no more. No, they left here wondering what happened. I got to get back. I told them I was going to do this. I told them I was going to do that. Oh my gosh, the destiny, the legacy has to continue. And so this is how we tell our ancestors here we are, what do you have for us? We are the descendants. We are the ones that keep it going. But it is us that deals with the rocks, the stones, the, the water, the earth, the airway, the uh, leaves that they leave here for us so that we can make that connection back to heaven. Matters of the spirit cannot be limited to the material or to the spatial temporal constructs and boundaries. They must necessarily touch, conjoin, and transcend soul, mind, spirit, and the body. We are all too familiar with phrases and terminology such as ancestor cult, ancestor worship, ancestor veneration, reverence, even those formulated to connect or explain 
trance and spirit possession. It is not part of my work to provide a comprehensive background to the history, perceptions, and ethnocentrisms associated with the origins and employment of the term ancestor in both scholarly and journalistic sources. It is, however, clear that legacies of these perceptions continue to inform, although in subtle ways, our ideas into the present. Since I specialize a lot in studying performance traditions, right? I look at the way the idea of ancestors, the world out there, are addressed in the context of performance. So I just want to draw one example here for you. Normally, when you have a, somebody important in the society who passed away or is deceased, and uh, being a structural member of the group, they had to celebrate that person. And uh, within the month or the week of celebrations, there's a moment they will say, well, we are going to search for him. Search for him. So in that searching, there are all kinds of mini dramaturgical enactments, including the fact that they give you the impression that he's still alive here. They saw him in that room just a few hours ago. Mm -hmm. He's still there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And typically, uh, in a performance, when they go to another village to perform, looking for him, again, they will narrate situations such as, <laughs> OK, so let's say the one who died, is, his name is Kuma. So Kuma, uh, well, Dr. Ray just prepared a breakfast for him. So, and then he said that he was on his way to greet uh, uh, Professor <laughs> Drew. He met him on the way, right? And they got involved in a heated argument. Heated argument, how? Why? Well, they want to see who is stronger. And according to, to, to the story I heard, that uh, Professor Drew said that he is stronger because he once encountered a Mami Wata in Cote d'Ivoire. <laughs> <laughs> So here is uh, Mr. Jivu, the deceased, who wanted to contest that. Mm -hmm. So he also wanted to start a journey to Cote d'Ivoire mm -hmm. to really find the Mami Water and ask a question okay. about him. Mm -hmm. So as we speak now, Kuma, the deceased, is almost reaching the border <laughs> of Ghana <laughs> and every coast. <laughs> so that's the face, how they dramatize this, to give you the impression that the person is still alive. In conclusion, among the Ewe people, ancestors are performed in very spectacular ways in both corporate and individual context of being in this and that world all at once. Our understanding should not be limited by dichotomous notions of coherence and ambiguity, sacred and secular, spirit and matter. Instead, we should strive toward transcending these binaries by acknowledging and an additional sense of what I call the numerases, where spirit and matter, this world and that of ancestors are constantly implicated in intimate reciprocity, a process best understood as co-presence. Every universe of ideas and cosmological orientations, including proverbs, social manners, gesture, and ritualized behavior in every day and in the supraordinary context of life and living may coincide and confirm those of other societies. However, there are specific local articulations and individual autobiographical identities whose narratives may depart significantly from those of other worlds. So founded between the 13th and 15th centuries by the Marinid dynasty, the Mila of Fez, Morocco was the country's oldest Jewish quarter. The quarter's name changed in the 20th century, so we're already dealing with issues of um, place and erasure. Um, its current name is Hay al Marinim, although I know of few who would call it that name. The toponym of Mila as remains the popular use for this and nearly every other historic Jewish quarter in Morocco. 
a city's Jewish residents emigrated from the quarter, from the city, and from the nation almost entirely in the second half of the 20th century. And while Jews no longer live in the Fazmela, the quarter is still a living site, now inhabited by a Muslim majority that recognizes its Jewish past. The Mela and its Jewish community were integral as well as exceptional parts of the larger city. For centuries, the Jewish community lived in the Medina of Fez al-Bali and were located pretty much in this section right here. The Medina of Fez al-Bali was founded in 808 CE under the Idrisids, and it was the Marinid dynasty, a dynasty that reigned from 1276 to 1465, that founded the royal quarter of Fez al-Jadid, or New Fez, in 1276. And it was the same dynasty that established the Mela by 1438. And it is this dynasty that gives the quarter its new name of Hay el Marinid, neighborhood of the Marinids. Due to architectural restrictions placed on the Jewish community, the sole monument in the Jewish quarter is that of the Burj or the Gate Tower, signaling a transition from Fez al Jadid to the Mela. During the French protectorate from 1912 to 1956, a hall built atop the Burj housed courts and municipal assemblies, but its significance exceeded its municipal function. More than a gateway and a defensive fortification, it signaled the sacred potency of the quarter as it housed a crypt for martyrs from those riots in 1465, shortly after the solidification of the Mela as the Jewish neighborhood. It served as a poignant reminder for the potential of violence, particularly in times of political transition. The bones or relics of martyrs interred there charge the burge, imbuing it with baraka, charisma of divine origin that had protective significance, and also the potential to strengthen prayers delivered at the site. Located originally beyond its southern ramparts, Fasi Jews had reestablished their cemetery when they returned to Fez in 1792. Bones that had temporarily been transferred during the duration of the two-year forced exile were reinterred. This relocation of ancestral bones strengthened ties between Fasi Jews and place, strongly energizing it with a legacy of their ancestors. This cemetery served as much more than a site of burial. It strengthened religious practice, it reinforced communal ties, and provided space for social interaction. Jews would emigrate from the quarter almost entirely by the end of the 20th century. But even after the quarter ceased to be a practical home for the Jewish community, the cemetery's potent position in Moroccan consciousness remained. Our visual journey is going to go to the rice coast of Africa, which is around Guinea, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia. They were actually tremendous talents in, in producing African textiles, and we'll see where, how that's expressed in the United States. And you can see over here, uh, th th that same textile showed us that uh, it was referring to the knowledge of Af African-like textiles these are worn by the Martinican women. They became famous for doing, for wearing these beautiful clothes. This gentleman over here, this is Bahanzen, the emperor of, uh, of uh, Dahomey, who was exiled to Martinique for 10 years, 1895 to about 1905. That's a picture of him in Morocco when he demanded to go back to Africa. So they sent him to northern Morocco, and within a year he was dead. But he was wearing a very beautiful uh, uh, velvet, and pressing the velvet is very important in, in African Laura. This is uh, a woman in 1906 wearing this textile. It's Ada Overton Walker, probably the greatest uh, late 19th century comed black comedian and black actress who, um, who was on Broadway at a young age. And she's wearing one of those textiles that, that, that uh, we, we were part was able to find this. In fact, there's a whole site devoted to her of devotees, a Ada Overton Walker. Uh, and she loved elegant clothes. And somehow she got a hold of, um, of an African textile of this quality. And that, that's what we think now, that there were more African textiles circulating than we, we, than we, than we know. These are the uh, African-American. Uh, we use these cabinet cards, turning leaf, 
to uh, to mourn. We're going to go to this very quickly. Examples: they would they would sometimes have shells that have flowers around them, uh, to, dried leaves, uh, and this was actually placed with the coffin uh, and, and the flowers. So it's sometimes buried with the coffin too. These cabinet cards are also memorialized. None of these were taken by outsiders. These are all taken by insiders. And so what they're doing is showing what they, they're in studios, some white, some black owned, but they show, but they're trying to, they want you to, in that period of time in the late 19th century, with lots of lynchings going on, lots of uh, defamations and degradation, de and terrible uh, blackface performers imitating what they thought blacks would do in, under certain situations. You had people who were doing this, whole communities. And this was from uh, Nova Scotia, we had the uh, True Canada, North, uh, New Brunswick, uh, Ontario area. We have many, many photographs with uh, people dressing really elegantly and showing their skill off this way. So I'm thinking about sensiotics as well, which uh, Henry Droll uh, defines as the study of the senses uh, in the formation of arts, materials, persons, cultures, histories, with a focus on bodily knowledge and that is uh, a key word that I want us to work with as we go through this presentation. The bodily knowledge in the creative process as well as in the reception uh, by mind-body, the automated response to the work without even thinking or trying to analyze what you are experiencing. By co-opting the audience into, in, into the Egungu performance, there's a suspension of disbelief. The guy behind the mask can be your friend but at that point in time is an ancestor and you cannot assume like you want to be body body with him at that moment because he's representing something different and that also heightens the spectacle like by just polyrhythmic over is an admixture of various yoruba musical form and styles percussion drums with other influences ranging from afrobeat jazz pop uh, to Afro-European art music. The, his signature basically is creating a groovy atmosphere uh, meant to train the body and its senses to perceive, respond, and understand the message with or without the facility of visual linguistic competence. And uh, Dr. Ray was asking me what, what, he, uh, what he was saying in the music that I started with. And I said, you know, music is language. Basically, if you can hear it, feel it, touch it, respond to it, without even knowing the words, you can get into the spirit of the rhythm. And that brings us to the idea of the Gelede, that uh, the deeply moving multi-sensorial, multi multimedia spectacle of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and movement captured in the praise, the eyes that have seen Gelede, have seen the ultimate spectacle. Lagbaja is aware of this fact in, in his artistic uh, rendition. So I want to show you uh, a live performance at the University of Ife and the automatic response of the audience to, to just the sound of the music before, you know, he starts singing. So, um... <laughs> When he moves into the crowd, people try to touch him, some of these people, and he words them off. Because normally, you don't touch the egungo. And uh, I mean, there will be an atoko, an attendant, who will ward off the crowd so that you can give him space to perform. And you also notice that immediately uh, he puts the mic off, is instructing some guys to make sure that that doesn't happen. And you'll see some guys blocking other uh, people from touching him, and they just create that kind of boundary around him. And that is uh, the kind of interaction that you see, uh, and being true to the artistic uh, and the spectacular uh, recreation of the Egungo masquerade and the sacredness of, of, of that performance. Lagbaja's work, uh, is, uh, the conceptual framework, 
employs the mask as a tool for, re for negotiating the gap between elit elitist cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitan sensibility, and political advocacy for the less privileged global Africa. And this is important because in spite of its privilege and elitist position and, and its acclaim, it remains invisible, it remains a nobody, everybody, somebody. We've been talking about the physical construction of Igungun, how there are vividly um, long layers of multicolored different types of, of fabrics, brocades, some of them have actual um, culturally symbolic meanings, significant symbolic meanings, also some written messages on the cloth. They're also embellished with different um, beads, cowries, leather, mirrors, and all of this creates a very dazzling and awesome effect when they're being performed. The body of the masquerader, which is something that we've also talked about, actually no longer is a, is a human being, but actually becomes the spirit. And you'll see some of these same attributes in some of the artists that I'm going to show you. Nick Cave is an artist and an educator who's known for his life-size sculptural wearable performance pieces called Sound Suits. These whimsical ensembles encompass a collection of found objects like twigs, sisal, buttons, beads, sequins, feathers, bottle caps, and industrial wire, toy and musical instruments, dyed hair, even human hair, to name a few. These ordinary objects are reappropriated into a new and meaningful cultural form. Sound suits remind the viewer of African ceremonial costumes performed in masquerades in West Africa and the Caribbean diaspora. Similar to Igungun, sound suits encompass the body and they transform the, the wearer into a new artistic spiritual form. The next artist is Ade Adekola, Nigerian-born conceptual artist and a photographer trained architect. Adekola incorporates historical imagery, architectural landmarks, and street scenes in his work. In this series entitled The Emperor's Clothes, Igungun, Adekola invites the viewer to explore myth and legacy and its significance in Yoruba culture. He adapts a historical symbol, the Yoruba, I mean, excuse me, a gungun, to connect with a global modern audience. He highlights the electrifying colors and bold gestures of a gungun in this body of work. The photographs celebrate the important significance of cloth, elaborate dress, and display among the Yoruba, which reflect power and prestige of the family and its ancestors. So these artists all reflect the importance of cloth as a visual metaphor in Africa and in the Africa di African diaspora. They all use cloth and dress and design to pay homage to their ancestors and also to celebrate both the living and the departed by creating powerful and visually stimulating works of art with important social messages. In this way, they honor the Igungu. In the United States, so Ogundepe was, was eager to participate in, in, global, in the global artistic sphere. At the same time, he felt isolated. He longed for his, his homeland. Uh, this condition of displacement gave rise to broader metaphysical questions for him, questions related to the nature of existence and, and questions related to his position within the, the universe. He began to work within the dynamic tradition of, of mythopoeia. What I'd like to argue today is that he is doing more than a simple escapist exercise. Uh, he is, is offering here uh, an imaginative new lens designed to make sense of what he oftentimes described as this inexplicable world and to frame his navigation of multiple cultural systems in the, gold, in the global sphere. I'd like to examine one of Ogundepe's seminal works, Detonation of Cosmic Seeds, produced in 1994-1995. Um, Ogundepe intends for this work to represent the universe at infancy and to capture the essence of life. According to Yoruba myth, the universe is comprised of, of two distinct realms the invisible spiritual realm of, of Orun and the tangible physical world of Aie. 
at the intersection of these two realms are, are numerous autonomous forces that regularly intervene in, in human affairs. On the one side, we have the Orisha and other forces that generally protect human interests that generally contribute to the well-being of the community. And on the other side, we have the enemies of humanity that constantly disrupt social harmony and, and bring about destruction in the world. Uh, Margaret Thompson Drool explains that in Ogungun performances that we are um, celebrating this, this weekend as well, and which Ogundepe frequently draws upon, past myths are, are represented, and I quote, through the fragmentation of the narrative structure. According to Drool, and I quote again, when reenacted, the precedents documented in myth are carried into the present where they are brought to bear on the current situation, much in the same way that legal precedence directs court action. The notion is that these patterns from the past, restored through performance, establish the terms on which the desired consequences can be negotiated. Simply said, or maybe differently said, in Yoruba ritual performance, the ancient cosmological and sociological concepts recorded in myth are, are ritually revived and provide critical departure points for the community. In paintings such as this, Ogundepe worked within this ongoing and dynamic tradition of mythopoeia to create these paradigms for contemporary life. Each work is essentially what, what Levi Strauss terms a, a bry collage and combines in, in seriate fashion imagery from, from Yoruba mythology along with related folk tales. As a whole, the works serve as departure points for philosophical inquiry into the nature of, of human existence and the ever-changing global condition. As Moyo Kedeji observes, Ogundepe turns turns the spectator into an active participant in the creative process. Viewers are able to explore the labyrinth of patterns, unearthing the treasures embedded within, and to look beyond that which is an in immediately visible to discover the subterranean layers of meaning. In 2003, Ogundepe noted, I want people to enter my painting as if a room full of, of a million delightful objects. I want them to begin to touch and feel and see and explore and excavate the many treasures of that room. I want them to respond with their instincts. I want them to respond with their feelings and with their emotions. In the resulting utopian images that we see, the values inscribed in archaic Yoruba myth are re and related oral traditions are represented and the possibility of transcending the ceaseless conflict in the world are made manifest. Ama Ray's piece is entitled Mami Wata Wata Mami. I mirror Mami Wata the hybrid female water spirit of African origin. She flows and shows across the diaspora. Why is it only now that I happen upon her? Is it because she's archetypally feminine and I consider myself not? But is this not a powerful reason as to why I should reflect her, tangle with her, mimic her, or make a humble confession concerning my denial? Maybe there is still time for Mamiwata to rise within me. I hear the ancestors reminding me that fixity is unbecoming of, to the Creator. Perhaps my iteration could be a truer mirror, a reversal of sorts. Ato imam. Yes, this resonates with my soul. Or perhaps I could explore another facing. Wawi mafa. Now that sounds like water a gentle tide washing in and away from the shore. So, despite my late arrival to at Mamiwata's place, 
I'm sure that I'll now encounter her with increasing frequency. I don't know about you, but I've found life to be like that. Once you know, you cannot unknow. I sense there's a proverb in there somewhere. And without the blinkers, the filters, and my load of preconditions, the dynamism of Mami Wata's ageless rhythms and wisdom are once again in motion.
Thank mm-hmm. you.